I've got you on speaker. Uh, I have a young woman here, and she is uh, doing a story. Last time I was in Pawhuska, I met a woman named Billy Ponka. I had heard of Billy. She used to work at the White Hair Memorial, the Osage Research and Learning Center. And while we were talking, I told Billy I was trying to find someone who knew an Osage man named Myron Bangs Jr. Billy hopped on the phone, started calling friends, relatives. And his name was Myron Bangs, B-A-N-G-S. And he sued his guardian. I was curious about Myron because the Drummond brothers were his guardians. Some of the white men the U.S. government had put in charge of the finances of Osages and other Native Americans. In total, the three Drummond brothers were guardians to at least 10 Osages, children and adults. And in 1941, the United States sued them over how they handled Myron's affairs. Myron Banks. Yep, they've ever heard of him. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. And have him spread the word. I need to know who he is. Of course, he's deceased and gone for quite some time. I found the lawsuit in the National Archives. Myron had commissioned a private audit on his accounts and sent what he learned to the government. He left behind a ton of documents with his lawyer. Other than Myron Banks Jr.'s records, there isn't a whole lot in the archives about the Drummond Brothers' guardianships. The official records are under seal in the Osage County Courthouse. So this is one of the most complete looks inside a guardianship that I've seen. When I've asked members of the Drummond family today about the three brothers, Fred Gettner, Cecil, and Jack, and whether anyone knew anything about their guardianships, they either told me they didn't know the brothers were guardians, or if they did, they had always heard it was because their ancestors were trustworthy. There's a moment in the tapes with Jack Drummond and his biographer, Terry, where Jack brings up guardianships. It's in the middle of an unrelated conversation, after Terry asked Jack about his relationship with his brothers. You seem to, as a boy, have been uh, friendlier with Cecil than with, uh, than with Gentner. Is that so? Would that be true? Y- yes, Gentner. See, Gentner was always jealous of me. Cecil doesn't used to be. Cecil just loved land. He, He's griping he about his brother, Fred Gettner, again. Remember, Jack was mad he didn't get that bonus after he made a huge profit at the store. He was also mad his brother ended up with control of the store once their dad died. Jack lays all this out to Terry, all his frustrations with Fred Gettner. Then he says, I wouldn't want this said, yeah. said or repeated and never bring it out in, the, in, in, in anything you write. But uh, Gendron was a hypocrite. He, he was very selfish, and uh, he was the administrator of my father's estate. Mm-hmm. And somehow he ended up with the big end of it. Of course, he said that seven shares, but then he, he dealt with the Indians. Of course, he made a lot of money off the Indians. And uh, he was the administrator of the estates, and he was a... Uh, he was guardian for several Indians to handle all their money. And uh, all the money never passed through Gettin Drummond's hands. Some of it stuck to him, uh, stuck to his hands. Stuck to his hands. Jack seemed to say his brother Fred Gettner had been up to something. And what I learned from Myron Banks Jr. was that Jack wasn't alone in thinking so. One of Fred Gettner's wards thought so too. And at one point, so did the United States government. This is In Trust. I'm Rachel Adams Heard. Myron Bangs Jr.'s lawsuit was filed in the 1940s. But to understand what led to it, you have to know that the Drummond's involvement with his family starts way earlier, back when Myron was a baby, not long after the 1906 allotment. Myron was born just a little too late to have a head right in his name. His mother, father, and older brother got them, 
as well as land. But right after the Allotment Act, Myron's father, Myron Banks Sr., and his infant brother, Percy, both died. Myron's mom, Lucy, was left to raise him on her own. Frederick Drummond, the Scottish immigrant who ran the store, he handled Myron Sr. and Percy's estates, which passed their land and headrights to Myron Jr. and Lucy. This made them both incredibly wealthy. But when Myron was 12 years old, his mom became sick. The records say she had tuberculosis. And all of a sudden, a lot of men became very interested in her affairs. There was a man named Robert White Cloud who married Lucy right when her health took a turn. Not long after, she went to New Mexico, hoping the dry air would help her symptoms. That's when a second man took an interest. His name was Bright Roddy. He followed her to New Mexico, all the way from Pawhuska. He wanted to write her will. By February 1921, Lucy was back in Hominy. That's when a third man got involved. It was another Drummond, Fred Gettner, who by now had taken over the store. He wanted to write Lucy a different will. According to probate testimony, Fred Gettner visited her every day while she was so sick she couldn't get out of bed. Lucy died a few weeks later, on February 24th, 1921. At just 13 years old, Myron had lost his entire family. The Hominy Trading Company was Lucy's undertaker, just like it was for a lot of other Osages who lived in Hominy, and Fred Gettner became executor of her will, the one he wrote for her. Three estates, Myron Sr.'s, Percy's, and Lucy's, all handled by the Drummonds, and then a guardianship of Myron Bangs Jr. He was orphaned, and all his folks, and uh, his grandfather, grandmother, his mother, and his dad, aunt, and uncle, whatever, they all died. And that's why he came with all that money. This is Myron Red Eagle. His name was on a business card Billy Ponka gave me when she was trying to help me track down someone who knew Myron Banks Jr. I'm a uh, cousin of Myron Banks Jr. I live here in Pahuska. Myron's on the Osage Minerals Council, the elected officials who oversee the Osage Mineral Estate. When I sat in that big room with Everett Waller, asking about non-Osage headright holders, I was just inches away from where Myron sits whenever there's a meeting. I think they named me after him because I kind of look like him. That's what my mom used to say. He looks like my Brother Myron, she used to say. So this is a picture I found of him at um, the Oklahoma Historical Society. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, it is. Do you think Do you think yeah. you look like him? Yeah, in a way I do, yeah. What features do you see? Probably a smile, yeah. <laughs> For what it's worth, I see it too. Myron Red Eagle has a big smile. I saw it a lot as he told me about his cousin. He'd give, give me a, a dollar every time he came to the house. <laughs> he just gave everybody a dollar, yeah. And they were silver dollars in those days, you know. By the time Myron Red Eagle met Myron Banks Jr., Myron Banks Jr. was in his 40s. He had airplanes. <laughs> he could fly airplanes. He was smart. He wasn't, he wasn't no dumb guy, you know. He, he knew how to fly a plane. I don't know what the rec- restrictions were on those days, but he had his own plane. There was a story about it. In those days, they had what they call feast, big feast, you know. And they had to start a fire, but they couldn't get it started. And Uncle Martin flew into the field, and he came in there, and he said, what's going on? You know, they were all talking Osage, and they were trying to start this fire, you know. He give me that thing. And he grabbed, he grabbed one, he stuck it one time, got a spark. <laughs> got a spark, started just like that. And he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to go back to Tulsa. I'll, I'll be back later. He got in his plane and took off. <laughs> He got the fire started. <laughs> they got a kick out of that. The Drummond brothers' guardianship of Myron Bangs Jr. started when he was just a child, but it lasted well into his adulthood. Because even though he was educated, could fly an airplane, served in the Army, the U.S. government considered him incompetent, said he couldn't control his own money and kept the Drummond brothers in charge instead. A lot of Myron's personal records are in an archive in Oklahoma City at the Oklahoma Historical Society. There are boxes of old handwritten letters, postcards and telegrams for Myron's travels, his honorable discharge from the army, even an old date book of his, maroon 
embossed with Junior on the front in gold. The week he got married, it's full of reminders to pick up pants from the dry cleaner and check in about the marriage license. Looking at all this, I felt like I got a little peek into what Myron might have been like as a person. Intelligent, persistent, a bit sarcastic at times. And later, when he became a husband and father, doting and pretty religious. In that archive, there are also boxes and boxes of legal records, because this collection belonged to Myron's lawyer, a man named Paul Comstock. And when I met with Myron Red Eagle, I showed some of these records to him. They're old, some handwritten, kind of hard to read. We have had so much trouble with our guardian that that we do not want our land leased into either his or, or any of his employees. This is a letter Myron Bings Jr. wrote directly to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, the head of the whole agency, right before he hired Paul Comstock. He was in his 20s, and Myron, he had a few choice words for the U.S. government about his guardian, Fred Gettner Drummond. He titles the letter, One Example in the Osage, and then starts describing exactly the kind of scheme you might find in the Gray Book, that report from the 50s that listed so many guardianships gone wrong. Myron said Fred Gettner was leasing his land to Horace Burkhart, a nephew of William Hale, the one allegedly behind a lot of the murders during the Reign of Terror. But Myron said Horace wasn't actually using the land. Fred Gettner was. And, according to this letter, Fred Gettner was trying to discount the rent for himself and charge Myron for a barn and a fence that he had put up. Myron told the commissioner that Fred Gettner was perfectly capable of paying the full price. He ran the Hominy Trading Company, after all. Myron wrote, Stand incognito in his place of business for one hour and ascertain the prices that he charges the Indians. I remember Mom saying a lot of times he was always fighting for against the, the system, you know. That's what it was right there. He was always fighting. He was trying to get something going. He, 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 he had sound enough uh, evidence to do it, you know. According to that, he was trying to get everybody's attention, evidently, you know. And he, he wasn't the only one. There was a lot of people in that same situation. Myron Jr. said he had written to the Osage Agency in Pawhuska that oversaw guardianships. They apparently didn't do much. He was fed up. He wanted someone, anyone, in the U.S. government to care. In other words, they went along with the guardian, you know, that's what they did. They didn't, they didn't really take up for Uncle Myron. They just pass the buck and give it to the, let the, let the guardian make the decision. You know? And if he makes the decision, there's nothing Uncle Myron can do. You know? So Myron was complaining to the agency about his guardian, and the agency was telling him to go back to his guardian yeah. with his complaints? Yeah, yeah, exactly what it means. Okay, no, Mr. Springer tries to discourage us in taking an interest in our affairs. Mr. Dabble or Dibble or whatever it is, yeah. is the only one in, in the Pawhuska uh, Osage Agency that seems to take any interest in our affairs. And it's hard to read. Huh? Yeah, sorry, this one's tough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. You see the point, though. Yeah. It was crooked. Even the agency was crooked. The real Indian affairs, they were crooked. They didn't want to mess with it. They knew that the Guardian would get whatever he wanted. And they went along with it. In this letter that Myron sent to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs... He says, we are writing to you personally because we cannot get action elsewhere. A couple weeks later, Myron wrote the Osage agency again. He said he wanted his guardian removed, that he preferred the agency have control of his finances, not Fred Gettner. And yet, as far as I could tell, the Office of Indian Affairs didn't step in. So Myron took matters into his own hands. He hired Comstock at the end of 1934, and a few months later, Fred Gettner resigned as his guardian. Myron and Comstock had enlisted a team of accountants in Tulsa to conduct an audit of his account. The accountants came back with a five-page report. The word confidential is written on the front. They offer a disclaimer of sorts at the beginning. They say there wasn't any standard way that guardians submitted receipts. So it would have been, quote, almost impossible for the U.S. government to conduct any sort of accurate review of how the Drummond brothers were handling Myron's money. But even without a lot of those receipts, 
The auditors filled five pages with discrepancies or issues they found after combing through Myron's affairs. According to this, Fred Gettner was leasing out land that Myron wasn't getting paid for, and he was making loans to people from Myron's funds that were in default for years before Fred Gettner did anything about it. Another example stood out to me. Fred Gettner Drummond apparently sold some of Myron's property to a man named Hugh Nelson. He got Myron $1,000 for the land. But a few months later, Fred Gettner bought the same piece of land back, paying $7,000 of Myron's money. According to the audit, Myron was left with the same piece of land, but he was out $6,000. It's only after the audit Myron commissioned that the federal government took an interest in his complaints. A U.S. attorney used one of the examples in the report and sued the Drummonds in 1941. The lawsuit is filed in federal court in the Northern District of Oklahoma. The United States of America versus Fred G. Drummond, R.C. Drummond, and Alfred A. Drummond. I showed it to Myron Red Eagle. R.C. Drummond, a guardian of the said Myron Bangs Jr., and Fred G. Drummond conspired and devised a, a scheme to defraud the, the said Myron Bangs Jr. in the following manner. The case names and all three brothers because even though Fred Gettner was calling all the shots, Cecil was the one who was technically listed as Myron's guardian. Jack Drummond was involved too. In order to be a guardian, you needed a surety bond. Basically, a promise from someone else that if you didn't act in the best interests of your ward or took advantage of your position, they'd be on the hook too. A lot of times, these bonds came from banks. But in Myron Jr.'s guardianship, the bond was issued by Jack Drummond. So all three brothers had a hand in controlling Myron Jr.'s affairs, and all three brothers were sued by the federal government. Out of everything in the audit, the U.S. focused on one specific land dispute, from when Myron Jr. was 13. When Lucy Bangs died, Fred Gettner, who was acting as Myron Jr.'s guardian, transferred a piece of land into Myron Jr.'s name. He paid himself $3,732.99 for Myron's account. The U.S. thought this transaction showed fraud because what the auditors found was the land Fred Gettner sold to Myron Jr. It already belonged to Myron Jr. It was Lucy's, and when she died, it passed to Myron Jr. The U.S. was arguing there was no reason for Fred Gettner to sell it to him. It is further alleged that R.C. Drummond, the guardian of this ward, had allowed the said Fred G. Drummond to draw checks upon the funds of said ward to incur claims against this ward and generally assume and conduct the affairs and official authority of such guardianship without authority of law and contrary to the statutes of Oklahoma. Yeah, that was, that was illegal. He couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't do that. The Drummond brothers had a drastically different version of events one a federal judge agreed with. They argued that this was all part of a well-orchestrated plan, a plan Lucy was in on. According to the brothers, they were just trying to keep Lucy's husband of less than a year, Robert Whitecloud, from getting her land after she died. And the $3,732.99 that Fred Gettner paid himself from Myron Jr.'s account, that was just to cover a debt Lucy owed him from before she died. The judge who presided over this case was actually the same one who gave William Hale a life sentence, Judge Kenimer. And what Kenimer said in his order in this case was that there wasn't any evidence the Drummonds cheated or defrauded Myron Banks Jr. He said the Drummond brothers had in fact helped Myron by getting him land that he would have had to share with Robert Whitecloud. The money Fred Gettner paid himself was a, quote, irregular way to settle a debt, Kenimer wrote but Fred Gettner was just acting in accordance with Lucy's will, the one Fred Gettner wrote and executed. Judge Kenimer said the county court had signed off on all this, and the superintendent of the Osage Agency had full knowledge of it. I'm not sure why the U.S. didn't include any of the other transactions that came up in the audit Myron commissioned. Maybe Fred Gettner had information that explained a lot of the questionable transactions. When Fred Gettner resigned, Paul Comstock filed a bunch of objections to the Guardian's final report. The county court overruled those objections, and the Osage agency signed off on it. But I'm not sure the auditors found everything, because while I was going through Jack Drummond's financial records, I found something else. 
This one's kind of interesting. This was actually part of the Drummond's personal collection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This piece of paper is unlike a lot of the other records in Jack Drummond's collection. Most of those were formal, written to business colleagues or bankers. But this one, it's written more like notes from a conversation between two brothers. The top says, Gettner Drummond told AAD, the initials for Jack's given name, Alfred Alexander. Below it, there's a list, numbered 1 through 10, each a description of some sort of transaction. It's number two, the one about Myron. Okay, Myron Banks, GDN. And Guardian. Guardian. 15,000 used in payment bill hell land repaid by a and Jack writes, Myron Bangs Guardian, $15,000 used in payment bill hail land repaid by AAD. $15,000 that the Drummonds borrowed from Myron Bangs Jr. to buy Bill Hale's land. Land that belonged to the mastermind of the Osage murders. Land he sold before he went to prison. I had read in Jack's biography that the Drummonds bought Bill Hale's ranch. It was that single reference to the Reign of Terror. It read, Bill Hale, a local rancher, had to sell his land because he was going to prison for conspiring to murder most of an Osage Indian family so their head rights would devolve to his nephew. Despite the auditors and the lawyers, no one ever noticed that the Drummonds seemed to have bought this land with Myron's money. Or if they did, they never said anything. This note was the first I had seen of it. When the Drummonds bought Bill Hale's land in 1926, Myron Bangs was 18 years old. Part of the land included 315 acres that Hale had gotten from an Osage man named George Big Hart five years before Big Heart mysteriously died in what is now one of the most well-known examples of an unsolved murder during the Reign of Terror. And what this note written by Jack seemed to say was that Osage money, Myron's money, helped the Drummonds buy it from Hale. I've looked into what happened to this land after the Drummonds bought it. It turns out, a lot of the Bill Hale Ranch they bought in partnership with another big ranching family in Osage County, the Mullendores. Eventually, the Drummond brothers sold their interest in the land to the Mullendors. Today, it's owned by a bunch of different people and ranching and corporations, including one affiliated with the Mormon Church. By the time Fred Gettner resigned as his guardian, on January 3rd, 1935, Myron Banks Jr. was 28 years old. He had spent most of his life under the Drummond's financial control. And that whole time, Fred Gettner was collecting a fee for doing it. More than $15,000 over the course of Myron's guardianship. Something like a quarter million dollars in today's money. In 1938, After more than two decades of Osage guardianships like Myron Jr.'s, the acting Secretary of Interior sent a letter to the head of the Osage agency. He said a series of audits the government had conducted on Osage guardianships showed that many of these guardians were profiting directly or indirectly off their wards. He wrote that it was a generally accepted rule of law that guardians shouldn't have business dealings with their wards, that it was against public policy, he told the superintendent to make a copy of the letter and send it to all the existing guardians and their lawyers. Meanwhile, Myron wasn't stopping at his own guardians. In 1939, he wrote a letter to Paul Comstock asking for his help with a young Osage man named Otis Penn. Myron said he told Otis about Paul's, quote, honesty and ability to help him in the past. According to Myron, Otis wanted an audit of his account. He didn't know who was leasing his land, where his money was being invested. Myron thought Paul Comstock would be able to help him out. After reading this letter, I looked into Otis Penn's guardianship. Otis was an orphan too. He had been under guardianship since he was just a kid, just like Myron. His guardian was Fred L. Shedd, the man who worked in the Drummond store. At one point, Fred L. Shedd was leasing Otis's land to Cecil Drummond and Hugh Nelson. 
the same Hugh Nelson who had bought and sold Myron's land through Fred Gentner and apparently made $6,000. So Hugh Nelson was also in business with the Drummonds, leasing land in partnership with Cecil through Fred L. Shedd. At one point, it seemed Cecil and Hugh Nelson weren't paying rent. In 1930, the Department of Interior threatened to sue them if they didn't pay $200 in rent on 640 acres of Otis's land they were leasing. And just like Fred Gettner loaned out Myron's money, Fred L. Shedd loaned money from Otis Penn's account. He lent Cecil Drummond $6,000. All these records revealed so much about the inner workings of an Osage guardianship. And it was all because one Osage man, Myron Bangs Jr., hired a lawyer he trusted, a lawyer who kept his files and donated them, so that decades later, we can see what one of these guardianships really looked like. They they knew how to get around people, you know, and uh, I'm not saying the the offspring are that way, but uh, they managed to buy the land. No, they weren't the only ones. There were other people that bought land, too, you know, but the Drummonds just had to be the one family that they got the most of it. And our people were, uh, they weren't dumb, you know, they weren't ignorant at all, but uh, things like that went on, they were beyond their control. Everything that happened between Myron Bangs and the Drummond brothers was because the United States considered Myron incompetent. Even though he had his pilot's license, he was formally educated. He was writing letters to federal officials at the Department of Interior, begging them to look into his guardianship. In one note, scrawled in pencil, Paul Comstock wrote to someone, if you considered Myron so childish and incompetent, why did you write him those comprehensive and detailed letters which are in evidence? It's kind of an irony about it. The Drummonds and Harmony were were kind of like uh, the, if, if if an Indian Indian person or Osage or Indian needed money, they were always there to give it to them. You know, they always had money, and, and if they needed credit at this store, you know, the Pioneer Store or whatever whatever they owned down there, they would give them credit, and uh, that and they they just thought they were good people. You know, as Myron Red Eagle and I looked over these documents. Myron told me this wasn't the only time his family had crossed paths with the Drummond brothers. Sometime in the 50s, his mom wanted to buy a house in Pawhuska. It's actually the one Myron lives in today. My mom had a little bit of land left, and uh, and, and Dad wanted to move up here because he had to drive back and forth to, to Pawhuska all the time, you know, sign things. And she said, well, I'll just uh, uh, sell a little bit of land and... Uh, and uh, see if we can find a house in Pawhuska. So they they went up looking for a home, and they found one out here. So she went to Cecil Drummond. The old man, he's a real big guy. But they, I walked in, and they all walked in, and he said, well, Virgie, what do you want? What do you want, you know? And they said, Cecil, I got a house, and, and they have a house in Pawhuska. Uh, I'd like to have it, you know. And he said, well, what do you got? And he said, yeah, I have about 40 acres over here across the road. He said, all right, you give me that land, I'll buy you that house. That's how it worked. They, tra- they traded. So he, and it was an auction. So there's about four or five different families were wanting that home, and it started out at $5,000. and That was a lot of money in the 50s, you know. And it went up to 6000 and Mr. Drummond raised his hand. He had a big cowboy hat on. He raised his hand, 6000 7000 he raised his hand. <laughs> he just kept going up, you know. They couldn't outbid him, you know. So he really wanted that 40 acres. He wanted that 40 acres. And he said, whatever you, he said, Virgie, whatever you want, I'll get it for you. He, he, he outbid everybody. And I, I still live in that house today. Do you ever wish you had the 40 acres of land back? No, no, it's, it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. They don't sell their land. As Myron and I spoke, we talked about members of the Drummond family today, the descendants of Cecil and Fred Gettner and Jack, Myron told me he knows a few of them, gets along with some of them. Yeah, they're, they're, it's a big family. It's a big family. I'm, times change, you know. Be that as it may, it's like that phrase says, you know, we, we can't do nothing about the past, you know. That the past is gone. You know. that what happened then, it, it's all in the past, you know. It's just too bad that it happened the way. It kind of it irks me in a way, but I don't think it irked me as much as it did my folks, you know. 
and older and other people of that, that generation. so pretty like how the gold contrasts with the blue sky. Even after Myron spent years fighting the Drummonds, a lot of his land still ended up in their hands. A non-Osage wife of one of Myron's relatives inherited some land after he died. In the 80s, she sold it to a Drummond. The section I drove out to, it's part of the 80 acres of Percy's land, now owned by Drummond Ranch, LLC. So this is Percy Bang's original allotment. Today, it's owned by Drummond Ranch, LLC. And that Drummond entity is owned by Gettner Drummond. And he is the one who's running for Oklahoma Attorney General. So this is all his ranch now. It's a very large ranch much larger than just Percy's original allotment. We'll be right back. Good morning. Can I help you? Um, we're with Bloomberg. We have an interview with Gettner Drummond. I went to interview Gettner last January. At that point, I was just beginning to put together what these records all meant. No one from back then is still alive today, but I was curious what their descendants thought of all this, if they had any other information that I wasn't finding in the archives. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Rachel. Gettner owns Blue Sky Bank and several U.S. cellular stores. He still owns the Pioneer Store Building in Hominy. He's been practicing law in and around Osage County for a long time. When we talked, Gettner hadn't yet won the Republican primary for attorney general. So talk to me about the attorney general race. Why, why are you running? Well, um, when I was about 12, uh, my great-grandfather sat me down and said, you're the oldest of 65 of my great-grandchildren. And none of them are going to do more than you. You're going to, you're the oldest. And so you need to just aim as high as you can and be as straight as you can and be as successful as you can. And I think it's appropriate that when your family has grown, that you serve in state government. It wasn't lost on me as a 12 year old. I mean, I was, I took very serious my role as the oldest of that generation and the leader of my clan. And then uh, now my children are all grown and established in the communities that they live and have the time and the opportunity to run for a statewide office. And that was Cecil who told you this? Yes. So do you remember, like, where that conversation was? Uh, we were driving in his car. Um, he drove. At that, at that point in his life, he would drive around the county all day long, checking on his sons and grandsons' operations and his brothers and cousins' operations, and he loved to drive in a, his big Cadillac and smoke a cigar. And he liked company. I think that day I was driving him. and uh, At 12? Yes, at 12. I was driving him around the county, and he was telling me, as we were passing pastures, the heritage of the land and who owned it and, and uh, when we purchased it, and then talking about my role as a family, the eldest of the family. Do you think about that conversation often? Uh, a lot of... The conversations from parents, grandparents, great-grandparents have been very impactful on me. One of the things Gettner's run on is a commitment to work more with tribal nations in Oklahoma. He talked about that when we met. Our governor, for some reason, just can't see it in himself to act rationally. And so he's driven a wedge between the Native American tribes and the state of Oklahoma. And I can, I think that I can undo that. I'm respectful of their sovereignty and can foster our relationship such that we can figure our way forward. Gettner also holds the title to about 26,000 acres of ranch land in Osage County, more than anyone else in the extended Drummond family. The base of my cattle ranch, Cecil purchased, uh, was passed down to my grandfather, Gent, Gentner Drummond. He 
has some of that original land and some of that was passed to my father, Leslie, and then some of that was passed down. Um, in my instance, I, I did not take any inheritance from anyone. I bought all of my land from siblings and mother and neighbors. So when, when did you personally first get involved in ranching and what led you there? It, it, it's an interesting segue into your question because uh, a, a, a native, uh, a, a neighbor of our ranch, who was also Native American, um, liked me and uh, didn't necessarily like my father. But um, as a 14-year-old, she approached me to acquire her ranch. And I was 14 and had no money and was a minor. And she arranged for me to become emancipated um, and enter into a contract to buy her 3,500-acre ranch. So that's when I began as a landowner in the Osage and effectively a rancher. And why did you have to become emancipated? Because you can't enter into a contract until you're 18. You're not an adult until you're 18. So for a 14-year-old to enter into a contract, I had to go to court, and the court had to deem me competent to become emancipated to enter into the transaction. Well, I can remember it clearly. Uh, the judge called me back into his chambers with my attorney and asked me many questions that judges now, I realize as a lawyer, ask to determine competency. You know, where were you born? Where do you live? Who's the president? Who's the governor? Who's the vice president? Uh, what are you studying? What do you want to do? What's the purpose of this? Why are you doing it? Do you understand the consequences of entering into a contract and signing a mortgage and becoming obligated? Uh, how are you going to make the payments? Things like that. And how were you going to make the payments at 14? I leased the land back to my father. When I met with Gettner, I had already learned his great-grandfather, Cecil, and Cecil's two brothers, Fred Gettner and Jack. They had all been guardians. Gettner told me he hadn't known that before we talked. I brought with me some of the archival records I found, including the Myron Bangs Jr. lawsuit. I'm curious if the name Myron Bangs Jr. means anything to you, if you've heard it before. I've not heard Myron Bangs, um, but I've heard of the, I know the Bangs family, yes. How, how do you know them? I just know the name. I know they're one of the Osage families. Looks like my... Great grandfather and his two brothers were sued by the United States. And I'm unaware of this lawsuit. I told Gettner I didn't expect him to read the whole lawsuit while we were sitting there. During that first meeting, I mostly wanted to share what I had learned so far. I also brought him the note from Jack Drummond's records with that line about the Bill Hale land. And then this is actually um, a, a personal communication. Um, it says Gettner Drummond told AAD. Um, but it looks to me, and I would be curious what you see from this, that um, $15,000 was used from Myron Bang's account for the Bill Hale land. Um, and I, it says it was repaid. Uh, so I, it just looks like it was borrowed from that account. I'm curious, did, do you know where the Bill Hale ranch was? And how, did you guys know that you bought that ranch? Um, now, the Gentner referenced is Fred Gentner, right. and so he's not my direct lineage, so I don't know the Bill Hale land. I assume AAD is Alfred Alexander Drummond. It looks like you know, basically somebody's notes on, involved multiple transactions. Yeah, the one, the one that stood out to me was the second one, just given this lawsuit. Yeah, Myron Banks guardianship, 15000 used in payment of Bill Hale land. Yeah, it looks, I mean, it could be that somebody was borrowing from the guard, the ward's account to buy land and then pay it back. And if that was the case, that would have been inappropriate. If a guardian borrows money from a ward's account, facially, that's inappropriate. It's unethical. In this instance, it looks like it's an, an accounting of, hey, this was borrowed, it was repaid, uh, and maybe back then it was permissible, but it's not permissible today. So obviously I'm not expecting, you know, like a 
statement on any of this. I want you to like have time and tell me what you see because I am not a lawyer. So I would love to kind of hear what you think of all this. But have you heard any of this before? I mean, you didn't know that Cecil no. or his brothers were guardians, right? I did not. What What do you associate with the word guardian? Well, there's a lot of good reasons for guardianships, and there are multiple guardianships in Osage County today. Um, typically, it's uh, somebody who's infirm, either mentally or physically. There's a frequent. There's a lot of guardianships over physically infirm people. Um, a lot of voluntary guardianships. Um, now, back. In the day, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, you know, the the law looked on Native Americans less favorably as though they were infirm. And the f use of guardianships was more frequent then than, than it is today. And clearly, I think, in hindsight, they were inappropriately used. Now, a lot of these Osages were not educated and didn't understand the American way of business. Um, and so guardianships were used to protect them from unscrupulous actions. The lawsuit I brought Gettner was 95 pages, and I brought some other documents too. So I wanted to give him time to read all of them before we talked again. But before I left, I asked Gettner how he was feeling about all this, his ancestors' guardianships, that they were named in this lawsuit. Does it challenge what you've been told about your family? Oh, I'm a realist. I mean, we only pass along the good stories. We don't pass along the bad stories, typically. Um, so it would not surprise me at all if there's bad stories out there, but those would not have been the subject matter of the family lore passed down. Do you want to know those bad stories? I, I, I'm on notice and I will inquire. I, yes, I would like to know that. So I'll look into it and happy to visit with you some more. Okay, just a second. See, can you hear me? I can. Okay. The next time I talked to Gentner was after he had read through the Myron Banks Jr. lawsuit, the case the federal government brought, the Drummond brothers' response, and then the judge's order. So you said you had had a chance to read through that. that yes, Rachel, lawsuit. I read the. Uh, the litigation that you left me and I don't have it in front of me. I'm in DC right now. Um, but I did read through the allegations by the government that alleged that the Drummonds acted inappropriately, malfeasant and the like. But yet the court found that they were not malfeasant or exploitive of their roles as guardian and trustee. There's an order and a final adjudication that finds them that uh, rules in favor of the Drummonds and against the state, the government. So, I mean, I, I mean, certainly, I mean, if your agenda is let's make white people look bad, then yeah, go for it. I mean, I think you've got all sorts of allegations. And when you read the complaint by the government, you go, I, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that my forebears were so horrible. But then when I read their response and then I see the court's final adjudication, I'm like, well, okay, yeah, they're guilty of being really good men that did the right thing to help this woman. I mean, are, are you interested in seeing some of these other... No, I'm happy. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm intellectually intrigued with the historical record. And, and and to the extent that my family was a bad actor, I'd like to know that. I mean, truly, I would like to know that. Yeah. And I mean, to be to be totally transparent with you, like we've we've heard from some people who have allegations against your family. And our job here is to see what's true and what's not. I mean, no, and I, I mean, I, I, I did not mean, well, I did mean, I, I, I didn't mean to push you gently in your chest because if your objective is simply just to paint all whites bad, then you're going to do that regardless of my input. But if your objective is to parse through the historical record to determine if there were bad actors and there certainly were, and if there were good actors, and I believe there certainly were, and be fair to the record, I'm I'm game to continue to participate and look at documents and visit with you. I I am the eldest of my generation. I am manifestly interested in 
that historical record that you have spent significant effort to, to ascertain. I've not gone to that effort that you have. But I do think, I mean, in, to, in defense of the system, the federal judiciary also was not corrupt at the time. And the fed, federal judiciary looked at this and there was an, it, it was acutely concerned about the exploitation of anybody, white, brown or black, in a guardianship capacity. So, you know, the, the fact that the court, the federal court said in ruled in favor of the Drummonds tells me that all acts of the Drummonds were appropriate. But, I mean, the Department of Interior has since acknowledged that the guardianship program was extraordinarily flawed, no? Oh, I think that it was probably flawed. But, I mean, the whole system was flawed back then. They, but you view the federal government's role in this as sound. Well, I think the federal government would have handed the my forebears' heads on a platter had it determined that they had embezzled or misappropriated funds. And and like, do you have any any qualms about? benefiting from that system at all? I mean, the, the guardianships and the executorships? Well, I, don't, I don't know that I would say that I benefited indirectly or directly from any of those things. Why is that? I, I don't see the, I don't see any indirect or direct benefit for again or Drummond benefited from the guardianship system. I mean, what about the, the Drummond land itself? Well, that was purchased from natives and non-natives. And if it were from a native that was in a status of incompetency, then it had Bureau of Indian Affairs or its predecessors approval. So if there are hard feelings today, then it kind of lies at the feet of the federal government? Well, I'm, of course there's gonna be hard feelings today because you know the 20th, 21st century Osage looks around and goes, why do we only own 6% of our original land holdings? And, you know, the same could be say, said of the Carnegie heirs. Why are they not lavishly multimillionaires? Well, something happened in between those four or five generations, and they've lost some of it. Not all Rockefellers are multimillionaires. And there are some very well-off Osages. Hmm. But they had to assimilate right and that's anathema to a lot of traditional cities they don't like that word they don't like assimilation i mean would you would you like assimilation if if that were your culture well, we and did people? i came from scotland and germany and we assimilated into the american way but isn't that the difference though you guys came here they were already here no clearly and that, that go back to that jacksonian you know genocide it was forced assimilation. Uh, but I think that there is a significant effort by the government, which is of the people, of which I'm one, that wants to recognize and honor and build up the the heritage of the Native Americans in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those. I, I'm a big proponent for that. You may not get all the Osages agreeing with you, but you could talk to the Choctaws and the Chickasaws and the Cherokees with whom I work on a weekly basis. I asked Gettner again what he thought about one of the other documents I left him. That memo from Jack Drummond with the one line that seemed to say the Drummond brothers borrowed money from Myron Banks Jr. to buy the Bill Hale land. I mean, I read those notes, but I mean, I'm a trained litigator and, you know, seeing disparate notes without getting testimony or other sources, I mean, you can read it either way. And so he does have notes, and they do appear cryptic. I mean, it was hard to follow exactly what it's doing. and I mean, and, and are there terms of art being used, or are these uh, shorthand for other terms? Uh, you know, it was – I didn't put a lot of stock in the notes that were transcribed by Jack Drummond. Since that conversation, Gettner's won the Republican nomination for attorney general. His only challenger in the general election is libertarian Linda Steele. I've also continued to send documents to Gettner. He said he's proud of his family history and that, from what he can tell, they did what they could to help Osages in the ways that were available at the time.
There was one other document I shared with Gettner, written by someone within the federal government back then, who was concerned that the Drummond brothers might be abusing their power, and not just in Myron Banks Jr.'s case. His name was Louis Stivers. He was the tribal attorney for the Osage Nation in the 30s. This was a U.S. government position meant to look out for Osage legal interests. And in this letter, he objects to Fred Gettner becoming the executor of yet another Osage estate. Stiver says the will in this case is valid. That's not why he was objecting. Stivers was objecting because of the person named as executor. He said Fred Gettner and his brothers were part of a, quote, association. According to Stivers, it worked like this. Along with at least five other white men in Osage County, the Drummond brothers would use their positions as guardians and administrators to extend each other loans from their Osage wards' accounts and approve each other's claims against Osage estates. Stivers then lists a series of examples where he saw this play out, including one of Fred L. Shedd's guardianships and the Drummond's guardianship of Myron Banks Jr., Cases where I could see firsthand how the Drummond brothers made Osage money work for themselves. But there were other names in this letter from Stivers that I hadn't seen yet. And when I started looking into what happened with those Osage families, I found a story that took me beyond deeds and mortgages. A story that I had hoped I wouldn't run into. That's next time on Interest. In Trust is a production of Bloomberg and iHeartMedia. It's reported and hosted by me, Rachel Adams Hurd. Additional reporting by Allison Herrera. Davis Land is our senior producer. Samantha Story is our executive producer. Jeff Grocott is our senior editor. Additional editing by Francesca Levy and Daniel Ferrara. Additional production by Victor Ibeas. Production support from Gilda DeCarli. Sound engineering by Blake Maples. Fact checking by Molly Nugent. Theme music by Laura Orman. Photography by Shane Brown. You can email us at podcasts at Bloomberg.net. Find more about this episode at Bloomberg.com slash Find Entrust anywhere you get your podcasts.